Uh, we're in James chapter 2, and we are, we are looking at a chapter that is very much used within the Lord's church, but we normally start in verse 14, because we like to show, we like to study about the idea of faith and works and how they're related. Morning, Tristan, good to have you with us. Who else? Anita. Anita, very good to have you with us today. Um, but the first part before verse 14 of James chapter 2 is a wonderful teaching. I mean, obviously, all of God's word are wonderful, is wonderful teaching. But we like to use the latter part of James chapter 2 for our day and time, for things that we feel are very important to study. And, and I don't want to take away from that. It is. Okay. But the, um, the, the verses prior to that, is very, very important for our day and time. Now, we started into chapter 2, and we looked at the, the fact of, of how God doesn't want us to show partiality and basically worked our way up to verse through verse 4. Um, well, we worked our way up through verse, verse 3, uh, but verse 4, that's, 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 com that's complete what we saw last week. Verses 1, 2, and 3 deal with the idea that they were making distinctions whenever a rich man came into the room as, a poor to a, as opposed to a poor man. Robert, good to have you with us today. And so let me read verses 1 through 4, and we'll look at what verse 4 specifically says along those meaning, along those ideas. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes... And there also comes a poor man in dirty clothes. And you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes. And you say, you, sit here by, in a good place. And you say to the poor man, you, stand over there. Or sit down by my footstool. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Now, I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to mention that idea of becoming judges with evil motives, that phrase specifically. Notice the context. What is being judged in this context? The attitude of those uh, opposed, apparently uh, showing partiality to those who aren't wealthy. Well, that is something that needs to be judged. I agree. But... He's condemning them when they are doing what you're saying, Bob, as being judges with evil motives. What is... Is someone responding? It's not very loud. Oh. Okay, that's something else. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess someone's coming through something they have in the background is coming through. Okay. Um, sorry about that. So what is, who is he saying is judging with evil motives? It's the ones who are, are, are making, um, who, are, who are deciding upon someone by the way their clothes look, by the way they're dressed, is, is his decision there. Okay. Uh, that, so what's their e evil motive he's talking about? What's evil about their motive? I guess I should say. I just said what their evil motive is. What's evil about their motive? Did everyone get muted there? <laughs> is, is anyone talking there? I've lost everyone. Looks like Denny's muted. Bob is muted. Yeah. People don't know how to oh. unmute to make comments. It's a problem. Okay. Bob. Sorry about that's okay. I was trying to figure out who was making the, oh. the background. Okay, the background noise. Okay. I didn't hear it until Ellen came in. Yeah. So what is their evil motive? They judge the righteous. They, they judge the wealthy man to be a better person than the poor guy. Excellent. There's what's evil about their motive. They're not thinking, they're not looking through God's eyes. God's eyes say, they're all important in front of me. 
for the for those in in their society. And by the way, let's let's not just condemn those in their society. If we're not careful, we have a tendency to do the exact same thing. We have the exact same idea. Well, this individual is more worthy than this individual is. None of us are worthy enough. Okay, let's make that point right off the bat. None of us are worthy enough. And most certainly how much money you have is not going to is not something that should be distinguishing whether or not someone is worthy or not. Okay, and so they were doing that. They were going against what God's word says, and they were judges with evil motives. Now, I don't want to go into a long discussion about judging. One of the reasons is, is because we're going to go into a long discussion about judging when we get to chapter 4. Chapter 4 is going to speak about judging. And so at that, if, when we're at that point, the, what it says in chapter 4 is oftentimes misused, and I'm going to want to talk about it then. But let me just, let me just come right out and make my final point what we're going to discuss in chapter 4, right now. The Bible does not condemn judging. The Bible condemns judging with a certain attitude. The Bible condemns the idea of, of, uh, of, of various uh, ways that we may, situations we may be in, various uh, attitudes we may have, incorrect usage of Scripture in judging. The Bible condemns all of those. Okay? Morning, Keith. But the Bible doesn't condemn all judging. Go ahead, Bob. Paul, Paul speaks of uh, preferring one another in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5. That were, they were not to prefer one another and do nothing without uh, with partiality. Amen. Amen. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, uh, Peter makes, get, comes to that realization in Acts chapter 10. I believe someone mentioned that last week. Morning, Linda. Morning, Michael. And um, um, Paul talks about it again in Galatians chapter, Galatians chapter 3. Well, he talks about it in a positive way. He says, there is no more Jew, nor Greek, nor bond, nor free, no male, nor female. All have the same access to God through Jesus, which makes us spiritual children of Abraham, okay, which is a long study in and of itself, but we're not going to get there. But, but the idea that we all have equal access. And so since we have equal access, since God recognizes equal access, who are we to make partiality against our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially, again, keep it in context here, especially when you're making your decision upon whether or not how much money that person has and how they're dressed as far as well in wealthy dress or poor dress, okay? Um, so, so this is a very important one for us to note, especially given what he's getting ready to say. He's getting ready to say that, that those individuals um, are truly sinning a great sin. Look at his comparison. Verses 5 through 7. Let's read that, and then we'll, we'll make comments. Listen, my beloved brethren, did not, choose, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. It is, not, is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Or do they not, do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have called? So he makes some arguments from the things, things that they, they should recognize. And this draws off. Remember when I said all the way through chapter 1, that chapter 1 was a table of contents for the rest of the book of James? Well, remember what he said about the poor and the rich just after, just after his discussion about uh, perseverance and growing in perseverance. He, he, makes it, he makes it clear that the poor and the rich have the same relationship with God. They have the same need for God. They have the same, um, they say they have the same richness of spirituality because of God. Okay, well, he's saying the same thing here. Did not God choose the poor? Now he's not saying God didn't choose the rich, but he's making the point that the poor were chosen by God, just like your rich brethren are chosen by God. Um, God's word makes it clear that being rich is not a sin. We know that. Abraham, Jacob, David, Solomon were all rich, made rich by God. It was not a sin. 
But God's word also makes clear that sometimes riches can get in the way. It is more, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. Okay? Jesus said those words. He wasn't saying it was impossible, it's just difficult. Because oftentimes we don't seek out God when we don't feel a need for something. Got everything I need right here. Got all my wealth, got all my riches, got food, got a place to shelter. And those kind of people have a more difficult time coming to God because they don't feel like they have anything, any needs. All right. So, so, so James is not saying God didn't call the rich. James is just pointing out God called the poor as well as the rich. They were already accepting the rich, that, God, that they have a position with God. He's making the point. The poor have a position with God. Then he does, and, and, he, and he says, you have dishonored the poor man. By showing favoritism to the rich over the poor, you're, you are dishonoring the poor man who are, who are on an equal status as far as God is concerned with the rich man. Okay? We don't normally think of it that way, do we? We say, no, 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 They're, he's just honoring the rich, that's all. Well, the fact that you're not honoring the poor in the same way, you're dishonoring them when they are on the same level as the rich man. Um, this is not peculiar. This is not peculiar to just the New Testament because clear back in the Old Testament, Leviticus and Job and Malachi, this this sort of thing is condemned. Amen. Amen. That, that's an excellent point. Um, uh, God. Well, if you go through the Book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of Proverbs is constantly point, pointing out the idea. And by the way, it, it points it out both directions. I love that about Solomon. Normally, Solomon points out about not showing favoritism. Uh, you, you need to treat the poor correctly. You need to take care of widows and orphans, just like you take care of everyone else. He normally points it out and, and raises the scales where the problem normally is. But then Solomon also, and I wish I had that verse handy at the moment, but Solomon also in the book of Proverbs says, don't show favoritism to the poor because they're poor. Don't treat them better in law because they are needful. Solomon points it out that way too. Now, sadly, or no, maybe I guess shouldn't say sadly, normally that's not the problem. But sometimes it can become the problem if someone tries to raise any class better than the other, to treat them any differently that they would be treated if they were, if justice was being done. Okay, justice doesn't depend upon our, our uh, how much money we have or not. In, the, in America, we have a statue of a blind woman holding scales to represent justice. Those scales happen. The reason the blindfold is on our eyes is those scales occur whether or not, uh, those scales show whether whatever situation that person is in, they're going to be treated fairly. The scales are going to be the same in treating them that way. 24, 23. What is it? Uh, um, Albert? These are also saying to oh. show partiality and judging is not good. Okay, one second. Yeah, well, what's that, Denny? I said, our society, what we have to be careful as Christians is, is it's, not, it's not that way. It is based on wealth what people have so we as christians we got to be careful of that huh. that we understand that in god's eyes and in, in our eyes everybody should be the same amen but you can see it anywhere you go in everybody knows you're the prominent people and uh they do show that respect that. i'm not saying that's bad but uh we just got to be careful of that Amen. No, you're absolutely right. There, uh, remember, the Bible also tells us, give respect to res whom respect is due. Honor the king. Things of that nature as well. But to, to treat them as if when they are in God's assembly, as if they are to be treated, um, as if the poor are not to be treated on the same level because they're poor as those without influence are to be treated in our hearts on the same level because they're without influence is, is not to be, as if they have a better position with God. Okay? Now, you mentioned the verse, Julie. What was that uh, verse? Well, it was 24, 23. 24, 23. Does it mention the I poor? I said to Chris, uh-huh. 
Um, oh. The me, 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 okay. Me. All right. Um, yeah. These also are sayings of the wise to show partiality in judgment is not good. Okay. Yeah. That one right there is a general one. Like I said, it says, there it is, uh, verse 23. You can see it, those on Zoom. Uh, chapter what? 23? 24, 23. 24, 23. These are sayings of the wise. Partiality in judging is not good. And that's exactly that's right. Leviticus 19 also mentions You're not supposed to show partiality. The Bible shows several places about not showing partiality. Again, one of the things I like about Proverbs is it even makes it clear don't treat the poor with partiality. But again, that's not normally the problem. You know, we all, we, justice needs to be blind. Okay. Ah, good to see you, Mom. Okay. Um, any other comments on that? Oh, look at how it says in verse 7. Do not blaspheme. I'm sorry, I skipped verse 6. We'll get that in a second. Um, Is not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court? Now, here's an interesting thing, and we see it in other places within God's word. That's in James chapter, chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, Jesus does something similar here on the Sermon on the Mount. He makes a point from, uh, from Scripture, from God's truth, but Jesus even points out about uh, in one place where it talks about not, uh, what is the, uh, making things right with your brother. Uh, he talks about that in, uh, Jane, in Matthew chapter uh, 5, I believe it is. He uses a couple of different arguments. One of them is, you could be dragged into court. And, and who's, who knows when you're going to get out of there, out of jail. He basically, Albert Brown's translation. But look at that in Matthew chapter 5. He, he, you know, Jesus wasn't above pointing out the obvious in the world we live in when it doesn't contradict with God's word. James is doing the same thing here. James is saying, you're showing partiality to the rich. Isn't it normally the rich that drags you into court? Aren't they the ones who do that in order to be able to take the little bit you have? Okay, the poor don't do that. It's the rich. So, so it's, it's a sin before God. And then James just uses, why, are you, why do you do that anyway? It doesn't make any sense. Why do you show them favoritism when they're the ones who are more likely to treat you badly? Because you're not one of the rich. Because they can get away with it. So, so that's an interesting argument. Like I said, you see that in a couple of different times within God's word. Normally God's word points to, that's a sin. Okay, and, and, and you shouldn't be doing that. But, uh, but God's word is not above pointing out, why are you doing that anyway? Shouldn't you be thinking about, if nothing else, your physical situation? All right, now look at verse 7. Uh, again, when it doesn't contradict with God's word. <laughs> it doesn't contradict with what God's word is saying. Uh, verse 7. Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called. Now, I think I spoke about this once before. Here we see the use of that word blaspheme. You know, we use that word blaspheme or blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Okay. We, we, again, the, the New Testament is not made up of religious words. The New Testament is made up of common, everyday Greek words. The word blasphemy comes from the Greek word that sounds a lot like blasphemy. That's where we did, they brought it into the English. If you, look at, if you look at the Greek word in anglicized letters, it's basically almost the same spelling. Mm -hmm. Blasphemos, I think, or blas, blasphemé. I, I can't remember exactly what the word is, but it, it, the word is, is right there equal with it. And it merely means to speak ill of, to insult. Okay, that idea, to speak bad about. Um, uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't a religious word. If someone insults me, they have blasphemed. <laughs> not because I'm someone who should be revered. I certainly am not. The way we normally use that word, blaspheme. You blaspheme God. Well, you can blaspheme people. You can blaspheme evil people. <laughs> you can blaspheme anything, an object. You can speak bad of, speak evil evilly of or, or or insultingly of is all the word means ah there she is hello this is albert hi i'm sorry that's okay we're in class but i'm glad you I, called i told you i'd answer when you call 
So say. Yeah, we'll. Uh, yep. Everyone say hi to Dolores. Yeah. Hi, uh, hi Dolores. <laughs> okay. Don't feel bad. I, I, I told not, them you'd be calling. Okay. Yeah, so, but I'm not at home and. Uh, oh. So. Um, okay. You know, Something uh, slipped my mind or whatever, but okay. anyway, I've been I've been waiting. Okay, uh, <laughs> I, I'm glad I, you're. I'm glad you okay. called. We're in James. Right. We're in James chapter two at the moment. Okay. Okay. Okay, James chapter okay. two, verse seven. Okay. And, and so when he says, "Do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called?" Now we have been called, um, the fair name that could be speaking of the name of Christ. Now, how is, how is treating people, uh, uh, how is not treating others as good as each other, how is that blaspheming, if that is speaking about the name of Christ, which is what I tend to lean towards, how is that blaspheming Jesus? Well, Isaiah, Isaiah tells us in chapter 9, verse 6, that his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. Amen. It's the highest name, no other name given under, under men is higher than that of Jesus. And so to, to uh, disparately speak of him is, is a sin. That's true. To despair and speak of him is a sin. Now, let's take the next step that James is saying. How is despairing, speaking uh, of using partiality with brothers... How is that blaspheming Christ's name? Because I agree with what you're saying, Bob. Because Christ humbled himself below okay. uh, that person and us yeah. to take our sin. Okay. And so uh, Christ put himself under that, per you know, that oh. person or I under never... me in order to lift okay. me up out of my sin. Okay. There's one way that Julie's saying Christ put himself under everyone to be able to to be able to save everyone and in that regard if you're if you're treating your brother low you're treating christ even lower okay i like that i'm thinking of another way as well that that's a good answer i like that answer um if i don't love my brother who do i not love according to first john christ yourself well that's that may be true but god First John says, how can you say you love God and you don't love your brother? If you don't love the one made in your God's image, you don't love God. And so to, to blaspheme or speak poorly or to treat lower someone because of their social class and they are a Christian, actually any time, but in context, he's talking about people coming together in, in, among God's people. Uh, to do that is to speak poorly of God. Okay. Yeah, okay. One second. Let me finish my thought. There's another comment in here. So, so we need to realize, you know, this draws on a lot of things. Jesus makes it clear in the Sermon on the Mount. We're not supposed to insult people. Think about that. Given what James is saying here, when you insult someone, you're blaspheming the name of Christ because that someone was made in the image of God. And God's word makes it clear that we are supposed to treat each other fairly. We are supposed to love our neighbor as ourselves. Okay. Now, what was that comment, Julie? Uh, that, that Jesus didn't even have a pillow for his head. How would these people oh. have treated Jesus oh. when he walked Who said that? That's excellent. I love that. Oh, okay. Oh, Julie said that. <laughs> she had another comment. <laughs> I thought she was giving that. I love that comment. Uh, Jesus didn't have a pillow to lay his head on. That's how poor he was. How would he have been treated if he would have come into their assembly? You know, think about that, the way they're treating others. Hey, okay. Albert. Yes. When, when you bring that into today's society, if you, if you have a mentor that you have worked so hard to emulate, to try to follow their teaching and everything, if, uh, if someone starts to badmouth him or her, then they're actually showing disrespect not only for you but for them as well and yeah. so that would that would kind of parallel with what you just said yeah yeah no one likes to have someone that they that they that they consider to be wonderful special uplifted to be degraded and again i like to turn that around and say that's god lifts us up and then for 
when a person becomes a child of God, God lifts him up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. We're going to see that in James chapter 4. And he will lift you up. Well, when a poor brother has humbled himself in the sight of the Lord, God's lifted him up. And then you are degrading that individual. You are insulting that individual. Hey, Albert? Yes, Chris. Um, when it's talking about that uh, person blaspheming the honorable, is he not referencing in verse 7 the fact that sometimes or more than most the rich blaspheme the name of Christ? Well, yeah, by the way they treat, by the way they, uh, do they not blaspheme the name, the fair name by which you have been called? Yeah, yeah. well, they, they may very well do that. I agree with you, Chris. They may very well do that literally. But again, when they are, when they are doing that to one of Christ's people who God has lifted up, they are doing that to Christ as well. Remember what Jesus says in, in uh, Matthew chapter 25? 25? Yeah, 25, where he says, when you have done to the least of these, you have done it to me. Uh -huh. Or, you know, uh, th that idea. Now, no, no doubt you are correct, hopefully not within, within the church, though, but the rich in the world, no doubt were blaspheming the name of Jesus Christ. Literally. I guess I'm just wondering if that's the argument he's making here about blaspheming Christians, therefore blaspheming Christ. Mm -hmm. it seems to me like he's yeah. making a general observation about the world. It, he may be. He may be. But I just want to make the, the observation that it even occurs when we blaspheme each other. When, when, when a Christian blasphemes another... A, once again, building off of what it says in First, in first John, hating your brother is, is, is hating Christ. It, it may very well be. Okay, but but what got me about the use of that phrase right in this context, he was just talking about dragging you into court. He's talking about what they're doing to the Christian in verse six. And so, yes, in verse seven, he may be making another point. And by the way, they also blaspheme Christ's name literally. Or is it possible he's saying in doing so, are they not blaspheming the name, the fair name? by which you have been called, okay? So I, I understand what you're saying, and no doubt you're out. I mean, huh, many, plenty of people blaspheme the name of Christ literally today anyway. So how can we think they weren't? I agree with you. No doubt they were doing that as well. No doubt. And that may be the specific point he's making there. But again, we, we can also draw off the fact that he could, that he could be talking about they're doing, it by, they're doing it by treating you bad. Okay, so excellent points. Thank you, thank you, Chris. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, other comments. Now, oh, okay, good, good, good. Still got fifteen minutes. <laughs> and, and please understand, if you got more comments about what we just saw, bring it up. But I, I most certainly have been looking forward to getting up to verse eight and the following verses with this context, because this is. Remember what I was saying earlier. Although the idea of partiality most certainly can be used in our world today. What we're getting ready to see here is something very important to note <clears throat> within the Christian world today, among God's people. Okay, look at what he says. And, and by the way, among, among everyone who, who uh, uh, well, you'll see what I mean in a moment. Verse 8, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, According to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you commit murder, thank you. Mm -hmm. You have become a transgressor, transgressor of the law. Now here's one of those things that I think is very important for us to know, and I love to use this verse when talking about what society considers to be little sins. You know, uh, uh, I will oftentimes go here for people who want to consider, well, that was a white lie, that's a little sin. Well, James is gonna make it clear here 
that committing one sin, breaking one part of the law, causes you to be guilty of all of it. Oh, what are you talking about? I never committed murder. I may have lied before. Oh. Committing one of those sins makes you guilty of all of them. The day and time that we hold every sin on the same level in our minds is the day we may be getting a little bit closer to thinking about sin the way God thinks about sin. Okay, we we in our society tend to rate sin. Yeah, well, at least I'm not doing that. You know, I didn't do what this guy did, uh, so that makes me what? <laughs> I didn't do what this guy did. What does that make me? Uh, a sinner. <laughs> uh, I may not have committed the ones he did, but I committed the ones I did, which makes me basically guilty of all of it. But look at how he says it. First off, verse eight. He's telling it, let's keep it in context. He's telling these people who, who are treating their brothers with distinction. If you, however, if, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. So you need to be loving your neighbor as yourself. That means treating everyone on the same level in context. There's a lot of other things it means, but in context, it means not holding someone partially as better than someone else in your societal minds, okay? Um, verse nine, but if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, at first you go, yeah, you're transgressing the law of partiality. But then James says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of it all. So in other words, to specifically in context to the people he's talking to, when you, are, when you are showing partiality, you are sinning, you're a transgressor of God's law, and therefore you're guilty of all of it. Well, again, don't you dare call me a murderer. What are you talking about? Guilty. You may not be in the position to suffer the ramifications of murder. It may not be that you can be dragged into a legal court and thrown in jail for murder because you didn't commit a murder. But as God's eyes is, in God's eyes, you are guilty. Okay? So this one, this one takes away all of the ideas that there is one sin that is, that it can, can, you know, that it, the, the leveling of sin, the, the, the separation of God as far as sin is concerned. Let me put it, let me say it that way. Okay, well, I'm not quite as separated from God as you are. <laughs> well, how much separation from God does it take for me to be lost eternally? Just, just any. Yeah, you need to be with God. So if you want to think in your mind that way even, if you want to say, well, he's more separated than I am, fine. If that, if that makes you happy, which it's not true, but if that makes you happy to think that way, then recognize, but you're still separated from God. Albert, I, I remember hearing uh, Zig Ziglar, whom you may be familiar with, yeah. say one time, if you're, if you're letting a hypocrite keep you out of church, actually, he's closer than you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, at least he's there, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Still might be lost, but at least he's closer. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very good way of putting it. Yeah, at least he's there. Um, uh, as if, and, and quite frankly, I love another thing I've heard on that, uh, is recently I heard on that is, uh, if you let the hypocrite keep you out of the assembly, you're worshiping the wrong God. You're, you're holding up the wrong person in that position of who is going to affect my, uh, being at services. The people who are there shouldn't affect your being at services. The fact that you're worshiping the God of the universe should affect your being in services. The fact that God is there or is not there should affect your being at services. Okay. Excellent, excellent point. Excellent point. Um, so that idea, verse 10 and 11, forever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. For he who said do not he who said do not commit adultery said do not murder. 
Now, if you commit adultery and do not murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. Hasn't changed anything. I'm sorry, Bob. Chris. Oh, that was Chris. Chris. Um, I just related to this specific verse. Uh -huh. You know, if there are a lot of verses where it talks about the sins that God hates, mm -hmm. um, and it, in, in my mind, like when you read some of those verses, it kind of declares that there are there are sins which enrage or make God angry. Um, oh, wow. And I'm sure all sin does, but I guess I'm just wondering, considering this verse, um, what, why did the writers point out to us these other sins as being sins that make God angry or mm -hmm. kind of creating a sense of, well, in my mind, it creates a sense of importance to avoid those sins. Does that make sense? No, you're absolutely right. Let, let me give you an example that maybe maybe what you're saying, for instance. Um, we studied it the other day in our Proverbs class. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19. There are six things that are an abomination to God. Yes, seven things that he hates. Okay, now, the word abomination is not used for every sin within God's word. But God does call some things an abomination. By the way, within that list is lying. <laughs> okay, and so, and, that, and when we studied that idea, we studied about, once again, the holding lying as being a lesser sin than other sins. And that same list is murder. Lying and murder are both seen as things God hates that, that, he, that are an abomination to him. So there are certainly verses that you can go to. That say that say certain sins God holds up and says he hates it and it is it seems like he's saying it's a worser sin and I don't necessarily want to go into a discussion of that that's a wonderful discussion but I do want to make the point you're making there are things that that supposedly seem to be very offensive to God. But even the lesser sins will separate us just as much from God. There's a verse where Jesus says that the one who commits a certain thing, and I'm trying to remember how he says it, that, that some will receive less uh, stripes than others. In other words, less beatings than others. And, and he, he's making the implication about uh, a punishment, eternal punishment. But even if there are levels of hell, to be in the top level of hell, if there are, it's still not. It's still going to be to be in hell, <laughs> you know. And so, and so, I guess my my point here that I see from James, because I understand what you're saying, uh, Chris. You're absolutely right. There are scriptures that seem to show that God really disdains certain sins, but all of them separate people from Him. Albert, yeah. There, there's one thing about those verses in uh, Proverbs six mm -hmm. sixteen through nineteen yeah. that you mentioned that, that I I've felt like that he said there's six things that he hates yea seven are abomination seven is used as a matter of completeness yeah and i've always i've always thought that uh, that seven are an abomination any sin in other words complete yeah. any sin yeah is an abomination to I, God. yeah and, and that, that is a very good point whenever you see the number seven being used it normally it normally is a completeness of whatever discussion is being talked about. In this case, it would be the completeness of sin. I'm sorry? Oh, about the stripes? Mm -hmm. What, Luke, Luke what? Luke 12, uh, 46. Yeah, yeah, Luke 12, 46. If you're wanting to see that one about some will be beaten with more stripes. That does seem to show, again, you know, uh, a couple of different places we see, that does seem to, seem to show um, a, a variance of, punishment um again it's speaking it, everyone is speaking about though is going to be in hell even if it is saying that and there's a lot of discussion on that and most certainly it's something we should we should consider in our studies but be, even if there are levels in hell as i said earlier which i'm not so certain there is but let's say there are um, being on the top level of hell is not going to be a blessing <laughs> you know it's going to be eternal separation from God, eternal punishment. Okay, and so um, um, there's no, Thanks, no. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for the question, Chris. That again, what the question you asked was going through my mind, and sometimes I 
Sometimes I have a tendency to talk about everything when I talk about a text, and that's why my classes and sermons are so long. And, and, so, and so I wait in that case for someone to ask the question and discuss, and I'm glad you did. Okay, thank you for doing so. And don't, don't, ever, don't ever anyone be afraid to ask, ask a question because most certainly someone's thinking about it. You know, uh, in, this, in this case, it happened to be me. <laughs> but, but it, you know, there's, I'm sure there's other people that are wondering about that. Okay. Um, so, so we see that in verses, again, this is an important thing to take from verses 9, 10, and 11. All right. Don't think, well, that's okay. At least I don't do that. Okay. Because God's word makes it clear that we are guilty of all when we commit that sin. And again, I think in context, you know, obviously in context, he's not saying, therefore, you can be executed for murder, even though you haven't committed it. He's just saying the guiltness, the guiltiness of it. Uh, we're, not, we're not guilty of the ramifications. We're not to suffer the ramifications, worldly ramifications. Um, so look what he says next. This draws off of that law of liberty he mentions in chapter one. You know, when someone looks at the perfect law of liberty as if they're looking into a mirror and they see the flaws and they don't make changes. Look what he says, verse 13, 12 and 13. In fact, let me, before I read it, I always like to uh, connect things in my Bible. This is a perfect thing to connect here in verse two. He's mentioning law of liberty again. It has to do, and it connects with what he said in verse one, in chapter one. So speak and act so as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, I want to talk about that law of liberty real quick, and that's probably where we're going to have to stop. We may have to talk about verse 13 um, next week. But look with me, if you will. Open your, I don't have my Bibles open. You probably already do. Let me open up my Bible. Look at the very end of chapter 1 of James. Because I told you that that word law of liberty that's used in James chapter 1, uh, this is one of those times where we have to remind ourselves that this is a bad chapter break, like all of them are, okay? Because they get in the way of, of understanding what's being said. It's all connected. Look at the very end of chapter 1, verse 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit the orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep one's self unstained from the world. And when he starts chapter 2, he's talking about one of the stains. He's talking about partiality. He's talking about the fact, go back up to verse 25, that you're breaking the law of liberty. You need to look in the mirror of God's word. And you need to see that this is something he has never approved of. And he certainly doesn't approve of now. Showing partiality for a brother because of their social status is something that God does not condone. He disdains. He commands against. And so when he says to keep yourself unspotted from the world, and then he starts into this, my brothers show no partiality in chapter 2, verse 1, here's one of the spottings. Here is one of the blemishes, the, the stains that we have to look out for, okay? And so when he says that in verse 12, so speak and act as those who are judged by the law of liberty, as someone who's looked in the mirror and realized the judgment God's word is making on your actions. And it's 1016 Eastern Standard Time. So it's time for me to stop. Let's go to God a word of prayer. Uh, after the prayer, I'm going to be shutting off Facebook and starting it up again when we get close to uh, when we get close to the assembly time. Uh, so for those of you, actually, we may start it up early again and turn the music back on. <laughs> but uh, so so, but I do need to shut off Facebook so I can start it back up again. Okay, so so be looking for it. Those of you on Facebook, we're going to be we're going to be having our assembly starting off with the Lord's Supper. Be a good time in these 15 minutes or so that we have to get your unleavened bread and your, and your fruit line, the juice, ready for the assembly. Okay? Uh, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. Father, your word just keeps giving. 
And when, and when we're so happy about that. But Father, sometimes it steps on our toes. Sometimes it points out places that we are wrong. And Father, we realize that we can take two directions when that occurs. We can keep on going the way we're going and not care about it or not allow ourselves to care about it. Not allow that care to change us. Or we can change ourselves, Father. Help us, Father, use your word the way we will on a daily basis use a mirror to check and see what the flaws are and then to change the flaws to the best of our ability. It's in your son's name we pray this prayer. Amen. Thank you all. Great comments. I appreciate it.